Good evening, everyone. I'm Lester Holt, and welcome to Freedom Forum's fifth Free Expression Awards and the first virtual gathering of the program. Next year, the plan is to host this event at Washington, D.C.'s waterfront concert hall, The Anthem, on April 28th, 2022. So mark the date on your calendars now. We look forward to seeing you there in person or on screen. I'm grateful for this technology that allows us to gather tonight to celebrate the First Amendment and nine outstanding individuals who have worked to protect it. As the anchor of NBC Nightly News, I have a front row seat to the events that shape history. And what an extraordinary time it has been since we last gathered for these awards in 2019. What strikes me so powerfully is the role the First Amendment to our Constitution has played the past two years, and of course throughout our history. The First Amendment empowers all Americans to use their freedoms of religion, speech, the press, petition, and assembly to pray, shout, publish, sign petitions, and march to make this great nation live up to its ideals. This year started out with a terrible reminder of how those freedoms can be desecrated and distorted. Thanks to the brave work of journalists, the world watched in horror as the U.S. Capitol, a building that symbolizes the democratic values we all hold dear, was invaded by Americans who rejected the results of a free and open election. Five people, including a Capitol Police officer, were killed in a melee that shocked the world. Journalists reporting the insurrection were attacked, cameras were smashed, and one reporter was pushed over a wall by rioters. The words, murder the media, were scrawled on a Capitol door. This in a nation that led the world in making freedom of the press an essential part of our Constitution. Hours later, after the police who kept lawmakers safe from the attackers reclaimed the building, television news was there to give witness to the men and women of Congress returning to that building to certify the election of President Joe Biden. Democracy prevailed. Free speech allows us all to express ourselves, sometimes in anger, sometimes with ugly words, even with outright lies. Even hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. The First Amendment allows us to express deep differences to one another. Robust conversation, not violent conflict, is what the First Amendment is about. We express our passionate views and beliefs by speaking, marching, publishing, and petitioning. It is our First Amendment freedoms that bind us as a people and empower us to make the case for change. Let's remember a teenage girl who in 2020 changed the world with her cell phone camera. Darnella Frazier was walking down the street in Minneapolis when she saw a police officer kneeling on the neck of George Floyd, who soon died. In a quick thinking and fearless act, she began filming and became a citizen journalist. She posted her video to Facebook, where millions of people saw it. The video sparked a worldwide outpouring of fury and anguish over the centuries-long mistreatment of black people. People in all 50 states and around the world assembled and marched in protest in a reckoning and re-examination of all aspects of our nation's culture that many hope will bring us closer to our ideals of equality and justice for all. Justice and equality are two themes you'll hear more of tonight. Six of the people we celebrate tonight are journalists. Their work in pursuit of factual information, justice, and equality is a living rebuke to those who would call the press the enemy of the people. We'll look at the legendary careers of the founding mothers of NPR, Susan Stamberg, Nina Totenberg, Linda Wertheimer, and the late Cokie Roberts. We'll meet Susan Wojcicki, the CEO of YouTube, the most visited social media site on the planet. We'll hear from activist and educator DeRay McKesson, who is one of the leading voices for racial justice in the country today. We'll explore the work of investigative journalist Julie K. Brown, who brought justice to the victims of a serial sexual predator. We'll hear about Jimmy Lai, a Hong Kong publisher whose pro-democracy newspaper and activism have led to multiple arrests as China cracks down on dissent. And we'll hear from General Colin Powell, a soldier and statesman who has used the worldwide respect he engenders to speak up for the First Amendment. It's been two years since we last gathered for these awards. 
And we've got a terrific program for you tonight. Let's get started. Please welcome Jan Newharth, the chair and CEO of the Freedom Forum. Jan? Thank you, Lester. We are so pleased to have you with us as our host for tonight. Welcome, friends of the Freedom Forum and the First Amendment. We have an evening that is designed to inspire and delight you with the stories of women and men who are champions of our First Amendment freedoms. You might be wondering what the Freedom Forum has been doing since we last came together for these awards. And the answer is quite a lot. In 2019, we made the difficult decision to close the museum. And last year, we sold the building to Johns Hopkins University. I'm speaking to you now from the Freedom Forum's new headquarters at 300 New Jersey Avenue, which overlooks the US Capitol. As we've worked to imagine new ways to achieve our mission to foster First Amendment freedoms for all, we decided that we need to meet Americans where they are to talk about the First Amendment. So where are Americans' attitudes on the First Amendment? To find out, we commissioned a landmark survey of 3,000 people that we call the First Amendment, where America stands. Based on what we learned, we are working on some exciting ideas about how to educate, engage, and advocate for the First Amendment with all Americans. We look forward to sharing more with you about these new initiatives in the near future. Just over a year ago, the Freedom Forum team, like much of the rest of the world, pivoted to virtual work due to COVID-19. Two weeks after moving into our new offices, we moved swiftly to adapt to working from home using Zoom to host programs, webinars, and classes. Last year, our education classes reached more than 10,000 students and lifelong learners around the world. We launched the First Five Live and First Five Now series, online programs featuring guests like CNN's S.E. Cup, Academy Award-winning director Brian Fogel, and one of tonight's honorees, activist DeRay McKesson, to talk about the First Amendment's impact on their lives. We opened our fourth exhibit at Reagan National and Dulles International Airports. Our latest exhibit, Fair Play, Athletes Speak, Assemble, and Petition for Justice, is part of a year-long initiative in which we'll explore how athletes are using their First Amendment freedoms to shine a spotlight on injustice. Our Religious Freedom Center completed a groundbreaking three-year initiative that produced the book, African Americans and Religious Freedom, New Perspectives for Congregations and Communities. Our PowerShift project convened its third annual PowerShift Summit, focusing on creating workplaces free of harassment and discrimination and filled with opportunity for all. A commitment to diversity and inclusion has always been an essential part of the work at the Freedom Forum. When my father, Al Newharth, founded the Freedom Forum in 1991, he brought the lessons he had learned as chairman of Gannett, where he was a pioneer in hiring and promoting women and people of color. You'll hear more later about how we carry on that commitment today. But first, we wanted to share something exciting with you that we've been working on this year, our new mission video. Tomorrow, we'll post this on our social media sites. And I hope you're following us at First Amendment for All on Facebook and at First for All on Twitter and Instagram so you can share this powerful message about why our First Amendment freedoms are so essential. Let's take a look. When people see us, they see just kids. But they forget we're the future, fast approaching. We're the ones reaching for the stars, Mars, and the moons. We're the ones dreaming big because we're free to do so. We're like those who came before us, inspired by the 45 words that take 15 seconds to recite. The First Amendment, five freedoms, religion, speech, press, assembly, petition that without them, we'd become not a silent generation, but the silenced. And for us to do anything, be anything, be anyone, be believers in good, chasers of change, 
seekers of truth, teachers of tomorrow, ourselves. We must go forth into the unknown, knowing only one thing is certain, that the era of us has already begun. With our freedoms of gathering together, of speaking up, of writing down, of beliefs, always remain free. For me, for you, for humankind, for good. The First Amendment. Learn more at freedomforum.org. That is what it all comes down to. Our First Amendment freedoms empower us all, young and old, to make sure our great democracy lives up to its shining ideals for all Americans. That video is just a taste of the powerful storytelling you'll see more of tonight when you meet our inspiring honorees. We could not have pulled off tonight's event without our event chairs, John and Cynthia Lee, our steering committee, and our honorary host committee, who made tonight possible. And I'd like to thank our trustees who guide us through our work with wisdom, insight, and courage. To represent that group, let's hear from a longtime member of our Freedom Forum family, Jim Abbott, the chair of the Freedom Forum Institute Board, Freedom Forum trustee, and former president of the University of South Dakota. Jim, tell us about how tonight's event supports our work. Thank you, Jan, and kudos to your team. The work the Freedom Forum produced in the past year was impressive under normal circumstances. Doing so amidst a nationwide pandemic is outstanding. Jan mentioned that her father, Al, a great friend of mine and an alumnus of the University of South Dakota, launched this terrific organization in 1991. I can hardly believe that was 30 years ago. It began when public opinion surveys showed that Americans trust in journalists was hovering somewhere near that of used car salesmen. Al felt that if people better understood the work journalists do, they might better respect the watchdog role of a free press. The work of the Freedom Forum quickly expanded to include all five First Amendment freedoms. The terrific work Jan told you about would not be possible without the support of friends of the Freedom Forum, such as yourselves. We'd like to thank our leading sponsors for this evening's event, YouTube, tonight's leading sponsor, as well as our platinum sponsors, the Reef team at TTR Sotheby's International Realty and Salesforce. We also thank all of you watching tonight for your continued commitment to our work in the First Amendment. Now the amazing technology that brings us together tonight also, all, also allows you to show your excitement for the work the Freedom Forum does every day. While you are watching the incredible program we have for you, click the link in the chat box or visit freedomforum.org backslash FEA to support the Freedom Forum's efforts to advocate, educate, and foster freedom, First Amendment freedoms for all. Thank you so much for your support of our critical work. Thank you, Jim. And let me echo my appreciation to all of you for your continued passion and support for our work. As Jim mentioned, we are so excited to be celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. On July 4th, 1991, Al founded the Freedom Forum. He was joined by people like Charles Overby, the former chair and CEO of the Freedom Forum, and an incredible group of trustees and leaders who shaped the first three decades of our work. Many of them are here with us tonight. Let's take a quick trip down memory lane with Peter Pritchard, chair of the museum board, Freedom Forum trustee, and former editor of USA Today, who has been around for much of it. Peter? Thanks, Jan, and thanks for the commitment to excellence you bring to our mission, fostering First Amendment freedoms for all. On this anniversary, let's take a moment to remember three leaders who started all of this, John Quinn, John Siegenthaler, and most important, our founder, Al Newhart. All were passionate about First Amendment freedoms and believed deeply in the value of diversity in the workplace. Here's a short list of what's grown from their vision. To defend free speech, we've sponsored thousands of programs and written and broadcast millions of words. Our hope is to help people understand that the answer to speech that you detest is not to suppress it, 
but to fight it with more speech in free and open forums, nonpartisan forums in our case. Today, our award-winning education team offers free online resources to schools around the world to help support these efforts. To promote diversity in newsrooms, we invented the Chips Quinn Scholars Program, which has trained young journalists and provided a steady stream of women and people of color to America newsrooms. Many CHIP scholars now lead those newsrooms. A more recent project, PowerShift, works to improve newsroom culture so everyone, especially women, has an equal opportunity to become a leader. Our international division educated thousands of journalists in more than 70 countries around the world about the importance of a free, unfettered press and the need for fair and objective coverage. I visited many of these countries. Everywhere we went, embattled journalists would tell us, you Americans are so lucky to have your First Amendment. Yes, we are. We should never take those freedoms for granted, especially now when the cancel culture and other censorship efforts have gained traction. To educate people about freedom of religion, we launched the Religious Freedom Center, which has helped thousands across the country understand how essential the right to practice one's religion is and to practice it without government interference. To honor Al Newhart's legacy, we started the Free Spirit Scholars Program, which brings students from all 50 states and the District of Columbia to the Capitol each year. Its motto is dream, dare, do. That's what these kids do when they stand up for the First Amendment. And finally, to bolster a free press, we built two museums in Arlington, Virginia and Washington, D.C. that brought the history of journalism to 10 million people and taught them about the five freedoms through world-class exhibits. As the museum's principal donor, the Freedom Forum made the largest financial contribution in history to fund First Amendment education. We're grateful to the many companies and foundations who supported our efforts. So the last 30 years have been a great ride, but we have more to do. We hope you'll be aboard when we launch Freedom Forum's 30th anniversary circle later this year to broaden the base of donors who are behind this great cause. Stay tuned for that. And now it's back over to Jan for a toast to all the good work that we've done and all the many opportunities ahead. Thank you, Peter and Jim, for your leadership, wisdom, and support these past 30 years. We would not be where we are today without you. Friends at home, please raise a glass of whatever it is you're drinking tonight to celebrate the 45 shining words that inspire our work every day. These are the first words you see as you enter the Freedom Forum's new headquarters. Thank you all for your devotion to our mission to foster First Amendment freedoms for all. Cheers. Now, Lester, let's get this evening started with our first Free Expression Award winners of the night. Thank you, Jan, Peter, and Jim. Tonight, we are celebrating nine incredible people who embody our First Amendment freedoms. First, let's celebrate four women who brought a new sound to radio news, voices of authority with a female perspective. I know you will join me in welcoming Nancy Barnes, the Senior Vice President of News and Editorial Director of NPR, to introduce our Lifetime Achievement winners. Thank you, Lester. In the early 1970s, four young women leaned into a microphone and spoke up when women's voices were really heard reporting the news, let alone anchoring a radio news program. 50 years later, Susan Stamberg, Nina Totenberg, Linda Wertheimer, and the late Cokie Roberts are revered as broadcast news legends. They are known as the founding mothers of National Public Radio, four women whose trailblazing reporting paved the way for generations of young journalists today. When NPR arrived on the air in 1971, it had 90 stations. Today, there are thousands there are 1,000 stations and more than 120 million monthly listeners. It was the founding mothers who planted the seeds of that growth and influence. 
While breaking news stories, they also smash gender barriers, bypassing would-be bosses who told them, we don't hire women. And in doing so, they encouraged other young men and women along the way. Let's take a listen to the legendary voices of Susan Stamberg, Nina Totenberg, Linda Wertheimer, and Koki Roberts. This is All Things Considered. I'm Linda Wertheimer in Nashville. I'm Susan Stamberg with All Things Considered. Nina Totenberg, NPR News, Washington. Hi, Koki. Hi, Steve. There were precious few women covering serious news. And one of the reasons that NPR was very successful is that it hired a lot of women for a relatively little amount of money. <laughs> and I was one of them. I covered the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, the Supreme Court, the Justice Department, and the intelligence community. The people who most influenced me were probably my female colleagues at NPR. And we knew that a lot of the men in the office referred to our corner of the office as the fallopian jungle. I'm the dean of the no, Supreme Court press no, court. You're not, Do you know what that means? I'm old. No, you're not, you're not old. The, uh, you're, you're trying to use that to get more time, okay. which I understand. I'll use anything I can get. From NPR News, it's Morning Edition. I'm Linda Wertheimer. <laughs> There's always a little moment of shock when you actually see what the person that you've listened to on the radio really looks like. So, you know, I always want to say something that will make you believe that it's me. People used to tell me, you sound like you're having a really good time. And I'd say, because we are having a really good time. Every one of these white hairs, I deserve them all. After uh, this very long career with National Public Radio, which has been mostly wonderful, punctuated, you know, by moments of terror. Koki has been a model for all of us. First of all, we were told out loud and for the record, women are not authoritative, women can't deliver the news. So it was very uh, explicitly stated, and we had to just break down those barriers. There was no question about it. She was really devoted to NPR. She really cared about this network desperately. She thought it was an essential part of a democratic system. The thing that I always loved about her was how much she liked politics. She even liked the sort of down and dirty aspects of it. She loved it. I think that Koki really saw journalism as a calling to carry out the values of our system of government and our constitution. Public radio. I know it's an old fashioned, old fangled medium, but it's the medium of my heart. Journalism has got to watch government, shine the brightest possible light on it, talk about its abuses, its rights, and its wrongs. It's what makes a democracy go. I hope that the kind of journalism we practice at NPR is a civilizing force. It's been my life mission to make it so, to help to create a community of listeners that they will be informed, educated, entertained by what they hear from us. Every second of it was terrifying and thrilling and inventive and wonderful. Please welcome Nina Totenberg and Linda Wertheimer to accept tonight's Lifetime Achievement Award on behalf of NPR's Founding Mothers. Nancy, thank you so much. This is a wonderful award for all of us to get and for NPR to get. NPR didn't know it was being courageous back when it hired all of us. It just knew we were cheap. <laughs> that was the role of women at the time. We got paid so little that a network that had no money hired us all and found out it could do very well with us. A Lifetime Achievement Award sometimes suggests that we're going to go away, but we're not. Even Koki, who died just a year and a half ago, will always be with us as a, an integral part of NPR, as are Linda and Susan and me, I hope too. And when we decide to stop working, and I'm not there yet, 
hopefully everybody will remember us and the role that we played in NPR when it wasn't the major news organization that it is today. So thank you for this award. Thanks to the Freedom Forum. Thanks to everybody. And now I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Let me associate myself with the remarks of my colleague, Nin Jotnerk. I very much appreciate what you all are doing for us. It's a great honor and a privilege to be, uh, to be getting a, a Lifetime Achievement Award from you. We have had wonderful lives. All of us have had wonderful lives. One of the things that is wonderful is that we had the experience of doing things that women had not done before. We anchored. Susan Stamberg was one of the very first women to anchor a nightly news program. I was one of the first to anchor the whole, uh, you know, Republican, Democrat, and then finally election night in the political realm. When Koki came to work for us, she was fabulous. She knew so much about politics from her family. And Nina Totenberg, of course, is a total uh, icon at, uh, and highly respected and revered at the Supreme Court for what she does. We have had, I think, great benefit from having each other and being with each other. One of the things that happened to a lot of us was when we went to work in news in the first place, first of all, we had insignificant jobs and then we fought our way into more significant jobs. We were the only woman in the shop. I remember the first time I walked into the WCBS news radio um, newsroom, I looked around for women. There were a couple of women, they were secretaries, and then there was me. And that changed, that has changed and changed utterly. And I think it is a fabulous thing. It's one of the things I'm proudest of, is I look at all the young women who are around the newsroom at NPR, and I think how wonderful they are, how well they do what they do, how proud I am of them. Congratulations, Susan, Nina, and Linda for your award that also honors the late Koki Roberts. Please welcome our next presenter, Barry Mills, President Emeritus of Bowdoin College. Barry will introduce one of Bowdoin's more famous alumni, DeRay McKesson. I'm honored to be able to present tonight's Freedom Expression Award to DeRay McKesson. I've known DeRay for a long time when he first arrived on Bowdoin's campus. And over those years, we have been close friends and he has mentored me and I have mentored him. He is a remarkable person and I am thrilled that you are honoring him tonight. Dre was a Minneapolis school administrator in August 2014, when 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot dead in the street by police in Ferguson, Missouri. A week later, Dre drove through the night to Ferguson, live tweeting to his 800 followers as protesters marched amid clouds of tear gas. Police told protesters if they stood still, for more than five seconds, they would be arrested. So they marched. They marched all day and all night. A judge later ruled that the five second rule was unconstitutional. And McKesson's tweet about the policy was used as evidence. DeRay has unleashed the power of social media to ignite the social justice movement that some credit with launching a new age of activism. His 800 Twitter followers now number over 1 million. Today, McKesson is working to end police violence through Campaign Zero. He also hosts the popular weekly podcast, Pod Save the People. There is growing outrage tonight after an unarmed African-American teenager was shot and killed by police in the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri. We were in the street in Ferguson for 400 days. So if you ever saw us marching, it wasn't that we thought marching was cool. It was, it was illegal to stand still in August, September, and October 2014. If we stood still for more than five seconds, we were arrested. How can it be illegal to stand still? Who made that rule? The police made it up. A set of officers walked up to me and they said, you can no longer stand here, that we essentially just had to keep sort of walking. And I think about Ferguson as a phenomenon. It was this moment where everything aligned. It was Twitter, a media landscape that was interested in a story. 
And the protest spread across the country, as you know, and people started to call it Black Lives Matter. About 100 protesters were arrested Saturday night in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, following the fatal police shooting of an African-American man named Alton Sterling. Hey, please, you're under arrest. What? Don't fight me. Don't fight me. I'm under arrest. Joining me now is Duray McKesson. This is one of his first interviews since being arrested Saturday for demonstrating in Baton Rouge. We should not have to protest. We should not be in the streets. And protest is the act of telling the truth in public. And I'll never be afraid to tell the truth in public. If this ruling stands, then it means that any organizer for any cause in any city can be held liable for any injury that happens. We didn't invent resistance. We didn't discover injustice. But technology has allowed us to amplify these messages in ways that we couldn't before and has accelerated the pace of organizing in ways that are really powerful. Duray McKesson, we present you with the Freedom Free Expression Award with our thanks for standing up for the First Amendment, the First Amendment right to protest, for using social media to inform and fight injustice, and for empowering young people with your life and work as an educator and an activist. It's an honor to accept the Freedom Forum Award. You know, the right to free expression is one of the bedrock rights in our society that without it, I don't know how the protests happen. I don't know how we push society to be the best that it can be. When I think about the work around liberation, when I think about blackness, when I think about all the work around justice that we do, it is predicated on being able to tell the truth about the condition that we're in. It's an honor to get this award because I know that I'm just one of many people who was willing to tell the truth in 2014, who didn't stop telling the truth in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, or today. That it is the act of truth telling that creates space for all the other work to happen in the first place. That if we are not willing to say honestly, this is it, this is how I feel, this is how I'm experiencing the world, we'll never get free. So. I hope that this award is an inspiration to people all across the country to also tell the truth where they are, because that is the first step to change. Again, thank you. Congratulations, DeRay, and thank you for your work educating people about the power and promise of our First Amendment freedoms. A free press is one of those freedoms we treasure. And three years ago, in the aftermath of Me Too scandals in the news industry, the Freedom Forum launched a groundbreaking initiative we called the PowerShift Project. Our goal was to create the framework that would produce workplaces free of harassment, discrimination, and incivility, and full of opportunity, especially for those who have traditionally been denied it. Since then, we've hosted three summits with top newsroom leaders and journalism educators. We created our signature workplace integrity training and trained more than 250 people to deliver the curriculum in their own newsrooms and classrooms. When COVID brought a halt to in-person gatherings, we convened online webinars and brought thousands of people together to discuss how newsrooms and journalists were impacted by the pandemic and racial reckoning, offering real-world advice on how to help. Let's take a closer look at the work of the PowerShift Project. I made growing reports of sexual harassment. From Hollywood to Capitol Hill to the media. The most vulnerable. It could be through being a minority, through being a woman. Disturbing allegations from six women. How many of these stories are out there? Be honest with ourselves about what's happening within our organizations. We push other companies and we report on them. We're not great at doing that about ourselves. In late 2017, when Me Too revelations exposed sexual harassment and misconduct in many media organizations, we immediately began looking at what role we could play in creating meaningful and sustainable change within the industry. When we convened the first PowerShift Summit, we didn't know how many people would be willing to participate and have these really difficult conversations. 
The most memorable moments have been seeing the commitment of media companies who want to solve this problem. You have to have organizational culture change. You have to have leaders who really want to make a change in the workplace. Our goal is workplace integrity, and we define that as workplaces free of harassment and discrimination and full of opportunity. Empowering people who are seeing this stuff happen to tell someone. My father was a big champion of diversity and promoting women and people of color. Diversity and inclusion is really in our DNA and in all the programs we do. How many people in this past year have introduced the subjects of harassment discrimination into your conversations in ways you haven't before? We've taught our workplace integrity curriculum to hundreds of leaders from media organizations across America so they can share it in their newsrooms and classrooms. As our country faced the COVID pandemic's brutal toll on people of color and the fury over the deaths of black men and women at the hands of police, we intensified our work to be allies in creating more diverse and inclusive newsrooms that better reflect and report on our communities. Our allyship programs equip people who want to do more to fight inequity and be better advocates for change. Having allies is critically important. I saw that from the very beginning of my uh, career, that it was really important to, to cultivate allies that would really help you, mentors. So at the end of the day, let's lift each other up because everybody has a struggle. We believe that we can improve the quality and future of journalism if we work together and we create safer, more inclusive, and diverse media organizations. Your support helps fund work like the Freedom Forms Power Shift Project, which is improving the culture in newsrooms across the country. And that makes for better journalism in the long run. Please take a moment to visit freedomforum.org backslash FEA or click the link in the chat box if you'd like to support this important work. Now, join me in welcoming Dave Barry, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Commentary, to introduce this year's recipient of the Power Shift award. My dear friend, the crack investigative reporter Julie K. Brown doesn't give up easily. In 2017, she began reporting on Alexander Acosta, then President Donald J. Trump's nominee to be Labor Secretary. Brown thought people should know that Acosta was the U.S. attorney in Miami who arranged a sweetheart deal for billionaire banker Jeffrey Epstein when he pleaded guilty in 2008 to soliciting a young girl for prostitution. Over nearly two years of digging, Brown tracked down 80 of more than 100 women named in court records who said Epstein lured them into a sex trafficking ring. Some of the girls were as young as 14. The deal Acosta arranged allowed Epstein to avoid federal sex trafficking charges. He served just 13 months and was allowed to leave jail each day to work. In November 2018, the Miami Herald published Brown's powerful series headlined, Perversion of Justice. Brown detailed Epstein's network of enablers and powerful people who played a role in his evading justice for decades of sexual abuse of girls. Brown also revealed the impact it had on his victims' lives. Some of Epstein's victims succumbed to addiction, abusive relationships, and early death. They weren't just molested, Brown said. They were betrayed by the people in government who were supposed to protect them. Acosta resigned as labor secretary. Epstein was arrested in 2019 and weeks later was found dead in his New York City jail cell. Take a look at how investigative journalist Julie K. Brown's diligence and dedication to truth brought Jeffrey Epstein to justice and gave voice at long last to his victims. Jeffrey Epstein. He is the Palm Beach millionaire who lured dozens of teenage girls to his mansion where he sexually abused them, girls as young as 14. The story has been reported before, but Julie Brown discovered 80 victims and wrote about them in a riveting series called Perversion of Justice. Reporters do this all the time, and, and it's important that sometimes we look back on cases and not forget them because it's the only way we're gonna really learn from them matter how many stories that had been written up until that time, I felt that none of them had really explained what had happened to these women and why it had happened. I sent letters to almost all of them. 
it took me a long time to convince them that I wasn't going to write the story that had been written before. I wanted to write the story about how these prosecutors didn't do their job. It was sort of a watershed moment for them because they weren't just molested. They were betrayed by the very people in government that were supposed to protect them exactly. and bring them justice. The Miami Herald reports Labor Secretary Alexander Acosta is out of the running to be Attorney General following the paper's bombshell report. One of the most disturbing revelations is that then U.S. Attorney Alex Acosta agreed to a secret plea deal that let Epstein off easy. Too easy for many. Today, we announce the unsealing of sex trafficking charges against Jeffrey Epstein. But I will say that we were assisted from uh, some excellent investigative journalism. Now a judge has sided with those victims for the first time in more than the decade that they have been pursuing this matter. If nothing else can come of this case and this examination of it, then perhaps there are some things that have to change so that this doesn't really happen again and that things aren't done under the cloak of secrecy. Julie, for your relentless pursuit of justice for young women who were otherwise denied it, I'm proud to present you this year's Power Shift Award. Thanks, Dave, and thanks to the Freedom Forum for this honor. Last month marked the 57th anniversary of the New York Times versus Sullivan, a 1964 Supreme Court case still regarded as the most important First Amendment decision in modern U.S. history. The ruling not only proved vital to ensuring a free press and protecting free speech, but the decision has impacted almost everything in journalism from how we in the media hold our government leaders accountable to our ability to help shape a more just world. The roots of this landmark case began in the civil rights era when the New York Times began to write a series of brutally vivid stories about racism and violence against black Americans in the South. A series of lawsuits followed against the Times and reporter Harrison Salisbury in an effort to silence the newspaper's coverage and thereby quell the public pressure that was mounting for civil rights reform. It's hard to imagine what our nation would look like today were it not for that decision which gave journalists wider freedoms to investigate the formidable forces that threatened some of the basic tenets of our democracy. Had it not been for that decision and some of the other First Amendment court decisions that followed, a lot of powerful people, people like Jeffrey Epstein and those who helped cover up his crimes, might still be able to successfully muzzle journalists who threatened to expose their political, criminal, and moral atrocities. In my lifetime, there has never been a more urgent need for journalism or a more important time to play a role in exposing the truth and giving voice to those who have not been heard. At this moment in history, when events and people test our resil resilience, when propaganda, conspiracies, and lies threaten to undermine all that our nation holds dear, it will be journalists who will hold the corrupt and powerful into account. Thank you. Julie, thank you for your inspiring work that reminds us of the critical role the free press plays as a watchdog on the powerful. Our next awardee is Hong Kong publisher Jimmy Lai. To date, Jimmy has been detained by authorities for more than eight months. He has been charged by the Chinese government under tough new laws designed to suffocate dissent and the pro-democracy protest movement in Hong Kong. China imposed these laws after millions of people took to the streets in protest in 2019 and 2020 to demand democratic reforms there. China is cracking down on that movement. Until recently, Hong Kong, a semi-autonomous territory of China, had enjoyed a much more open society. Let's welcome Washington Post columnist Jason Rezaian, who was unjustly imprisoned by the government of Iran for 544 days, from 2014 to 2016, for his reporting there, to introduce the story of Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai fled mainland China for Hong Kong as a stowaway on a fishing boat when he was just 12 years old. His wealthy family lost everything when the communists came to power in 1949. Lai worked in sweatshops and went on to found the international clothing chain Giordana, 
which made him a wealthy man. When Chinese tanks crushed the student pro-democracy demonstration in Beijing's Tiananmen Square in 1989, Lai refused to stay silent. He wrote newspaper columns, critical of the massacre of the protesters. China threatened to close his stores there. He sold the stores and went on to establish the digital magazine Next and the Apple Daily, Hong Kong's leading pro-democracy newspaper. Jimmy wrote columns in support of the democracy movement and last year marched alongside a million protesters through the streets of Hong Kong. In 2020, the Chinese government arrested and jailed him, along with his sons and his company's executives. Jimmy Lai's home has been firebombed and assassins plotted against him. The charges he now faces include a possible life sentence. Let's take a look at Jimmy Lai, who once told an interviewer, I am a troublemaker. The freedom of this place has given me everything. Now here in Hong Kong, the Apple Daily is a popular tabloid newspaper. I'm holding a copy right now with a pro-democracy point of view. Apple Daily is owned by Next Media. It's all part of a media empire owned by Jimmy Lai. The best way to use my money is to go into the media because to deliver information is actually delivering liberty. Lai has been a vocal figure in the fight for democracy for years. We want to have the freedom. We want to have the democracy that we are entitled to. And that's why we are fighting for it. China's controversial national security law is in full effect. Critics of this new law say it'll be twisted to quash freedom of speech, assembly, the independent judiciary, and political dissent. This rush implementation of the national security law is actually a blunder that CCP hasn't fought it through. Is everything you're saying here, sir, actually a violation of this new security law? Yes. And, and that doesn't worry you? No. Is there not a chance that you could be spirited away in the middle of the night to a prison in mainland China? Yes. But what can I do? Just keep quiet. We do want to begin in Hong Kong, where the new national security law has just swept up one of that city's most high profile critics of Chinese rule. We're talking about media mogul and pro democracy activist Jimmy Lai. The effect of this arrest has spread very quickly through Hong Kong on social media with many pro-democracy activists condemning this arrest, saying that it's the end of press freedom in Hong Kong and Hong Kong's freedom of speech. If found guilty, Lai could face life in prison. You know, being a Catholic, you have the instinct to stand up to injustice, to evil. I am what I am. I am what I believe. I cannot change it. I have to accept my fate with grace. Please welcome Sebastian Lai, who will accept this free expression award on behalf of his father, the fearless freedom fighter, Jimmy Lai. Hello, I'd like to thank Freedom Forum on behalf of my father for this award. It's been a tough year where we've seen the erosion of freedom of speech around the world. This has been especially visible in Hong Kong. Many of the rights that we used to take for granted have now been taken from us. As you can see from the 47 people who have been recently charged for what is essentially inciting democracy. Freedom of speech comes very easy to most people. It's something that most of us take for granted. So the work that an organization like Freedom Forum does in highlighting when these rights have been violated uh, is incredibly important. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian, and please send our best wishes to your father that he is soon free to advance the cause of democracy in Hong Kong. Our next presenter is a motivational speaker, author, and model with more than 2 million followers on YouTube. She creates videos about her life as a makeup and sushi-loving millennial who also happens to be blind. Please welcome Molly Burke. I'm so excited to be here tonight to present Susan Wojcicki with the Free Expression Award.
As the CEO of YouTube, Susan is facing some of the most critical issues around free expression today. When billions of people are on your platform every day, how do you make sure that everybody has a voice but also feels safe? And how do you do that across the versions of YouTube that exist in 100 different countries and 80 different languages? These questions are important to me because YouTube is where I found my voice. You might not be able to tell by looking at me, but I'm blind. I lost the majority of my vision when I was 14, and that year it felt like my life was falling apart. Until I found a group of girls online who loved beauty and fashion as much as I do. When I no longer had friends in real life to turn to, I found these online creators to turn to, and they felt like my friends. I knew that one day I wanted to be able to build that same sense of community for other people around the world who felt like they didn't fit in. And six years ago, that's what I did. Now, every single day, I get to share my story and advocate for a world that's more accessible for everyone. YouTube gave me that opportunity, and every day, YouTube gives people the opportunity to express themselves and the freedom to feel like they have somewhere that they belong. The freedom that YouTube gave me is so important to me, and I'm so grateful. And that's why I feel honored to introduce to you Susan Wojcicki, the CEO of YouTube. She's been called one of the most powerful women in technology today, but for creators around the world, we just know her as Susan. Let's take a look at her work. Susan Wojcicki is shaping the way that over a billion people access the media. She is unquestionably one of the most powerful media executives on the planet. Video has never been easier to create, it's never been easier to watch. And so we think about ourselves as a platform for the next generation of media companies to be able to create content and to distribute it to the world. And I also really care deeply about the freedom of expression and the fact that people all over the world can use it to tell their story. Are you a feminist or a womanist? A question a lot of black women will The rundown, the rundown, the 101 on the language of the blind. It's incredibly important that we have a responsibility framework, and that has been my number one priority. We're removing content that violates our policies. You can go too far, and that can become censorship. And so we have been working really hard to figure out what's the right way to balance responsibility with freedom of speech. Susan's also helping to reimagine and reshape what's possible for women around the world. Ever since Susan started running on YouTube, the percentage of women in YouTube has increased significantly. Representation matters. If women do not participate in tech, they're losing the chance to influence the largest economic and social shift of this century. We realize we have really broad reach and we want to make sure that we, as a platform, are using it for good. I know I can make it better and that's why I'm here. Susan, I'm so honored to be able to present you tonight with a free expression award for your incredible leadership with YouTube. And I just wanna say thank you for all the work that you've done to empower people around the world to share their story. And I'm thrilled to be able to ask you some questions about your perspective on free expression. Thank you, Molly. Thank you so much for being here and joining me here tonight. Now, I know that your passion for free speech has been in part impacted due to your family's history. Can you share how your family's experience has shaped your ideas of free speech? Sure. Uh, well, so on both sides of my family, they came to the United States because of the need um, or different kinds of persecution. On my father's side, um, it was due to political persecution. My father came from Poland and for a variety of reasons, um, after World War II, um, it became important for them to leave. Uh, and my father escaped from Poland and wound up coming to the United States. And, uh, you know, my grandfather was never able to leave. He remained in Poland and was behind the Iron Curtain. And I saw how difficult it was to communicate with him, uh, to be able to worry about what you were saying to him and for him to have concerns about, um, what was said or what was even sent to him. And then on my mother's side, they came to the United States for religious persecution. And so I've just seen the real benefits that 
freedom of speech has, as well as representing all people of all different backgrounds and all different perspectives. And that the freedoms we have, we really can't take for granted, that we really have to um, make sure that we're protecting them in every way possible. And I feel, um, because of my family history, a deep connection to, to those freedoms. And I'm very thankful for the freedoms that I have. Absolutely, as we all should be. Um, now, when I started on YouTube, all I really wanted to do was just be authentic and share my story. But of course, as I've grown, there's been more pressure to speak for others in my community. And with that becomes a lot of responsibility. And I know at YouTube, you guys are always juggling responsibility at such a high level, always needing to try to balance people's right to free speech with protecting our community from content that can be harmful. So can you talk to us a little about that? Sure. Um, well, first of all, we want to be able to have as diverse and open a platform as possible and represent as many views as possible on the platform. But we also need to make sure that there are limits and that we can see that sometimes um, that um, we, you know, we've always since the very beginning of YouTube have had community guidelines because we've realized that there are certain types of content, um, like some of the very beginning, we wouldn't allow um, adult content, hate content. Um, dangerous content, all of those types of content could really make it that YouTube was no longer a platform that was viable for all these other voices out there. And so we've always had community guidelines, but as YouTube has become bigger and um, has had more of an impact, we've seen the need to increase what we're doing from a responsibility standpoint. And this has been an area of increasing importance for us as we have certainly gotten bigger. And we call this whole work the responsibility work. And we actually talk about the four R's of responsibility. It involves literally thousands of people and a large amount of work across the entire company. But, uh, but uh, if I sum it into these four different R's, the first one would be remove, which is that we're always updating our policies and when content is violative of, of any of the policies, uh, unfortunately we need to remove it. And uh, so we removed 9 million videos last quarter um, and almost all of them, over 90%, we was removed with machines, which is good because it means if there's content that's violative, we find that really quickly. Um, and the second one um, is, is raise. So being able to um, raise up um, authoritative information. So for example, in the pandemic, um, we served hundreds of billions of impressions that came from different health organizations, like whether it was the CDC or the equivalent in countries all over the world. Um, and making sure that people get information from um, the right medical sources in the case of COVID or, or news from authoritative sources. So we're working to make sure that we can raise up um, the information that we uh, is valuable for our users. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of content that technically meets the spirit of what we're trying to do, but it is, uh, it's borderline. And so for that content, we um, will just reduce, meaning we're not gonna recommend it uh, to our users, it's still on the platform, but it's content that is not necessarily recommended by our platform. And the last one is, is reward, which is that we have a higher standard for where we serve our advertising dollars. And that has many reasons. A, we want to, um, you know, at, we want to do the right thing for our advertisers and they care a lot where their ads show up, but we also want to protect creators like you who have built businesses with really, really valuable content and make sure that you're, um, that we don't have a situation where advertisers pull their spend because there's some content on it that they're not comfortable with. So we want to make sure we're protecting all the valuable creators like you. So those are the four R's of responsibility that we think about as we are, uh, as YouTube is growing and we're continuing to invest. And it's been a huge priority for me at YouTube to make sure that we are balancing the openness of YouTube, but also the responsibility. That's fantastic. I think all of those are very valuable steps that YouTube has taken. And I'm curious to hear how you feel free speech plays out on YouTube with creativity. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, first of all, I think that YouTube has really enabled a lot more creativity. And I think it's amazing we have creators like you um, on the platform and that we can hear from you from you know, different perspectives that we probably wouldn't have heard with traditional media. And I also just look over my lifetime. So when I was a kid, I remember there were just, I don't know, not that many channels, um, probably less than a, a hundred at the most channels. And 
maybe when I was a teenager, there were a couple hundred. And now with YouTube, we have millions and millions of channels. And that has just unleashed a huge number of different views and perspectives. And we can hear from people that we never would have heard from beforehand. Absolutely. Thank you, Susan, for chatting with me and congrats on your very well-deserved award. Thank you so much to the Freedom Forum for having me here today and for this award. I recognize the significance of freedom of speech and I'm so honored to be here today to receive this award. Susan, congratulations and thank you for those insights. And now we move to our final presenter of the evening, a colleague of mine. Please welcome NBC News Chief Washington and Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell, who will introduce our final free expression honoree of the night. Hello, everyone. I am honored to introduce our final free expression award winner of the night, the Global Freedom of Expression Leadership Award, which goes to General Colin Powell. General Powell is a soldier who has served our nation from Vietnam to the Gulf War and a statesman in peacetime. He was Ronald Reagan's national security advisor, George Herbert Walker Bush's chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and George W. Bush's secretary of state. He led men and women who fought and died to protect the freedoms represented by the American flag. And he also publicly and powerfully supported the right of those who chose to protest against it. General Powell has been fearless in combat and courageous in peacetime in speaking truth to power. When the president of the United States criticized the press as enemies of the people, General Powell said, no, you're not supposed to like everything the press says or what anyone says. That's why we have a First Amendment, to protect that kind of speech. General Powell is known for his integrity, his dedication to public service, and his devotion to the Constitution that preserves and protects the freedoms that we all hold dear. So let's take a look at the inspirational career and life of General Colin Powell. The First Amendment right of free speech is intended to protect the controversial and even the outrageous word, and not just comforting platitudes too mundane to need protection. But for this freedom to hear all views, you bear a burden to sort out wisdom from foolishness. You're not supposed to like everything the press says or what anyone says in the First Amendment. That's why we have a First Amendment, to protect that kind of speech. I'd like to read something that General Powell said about this amendment. I would not amend that great shield of democracy to hammer a few miscreants. The flag will be flying proudly long after they have slunk away. I once interviewed him and said, General Powell, here you are, son of Jamaican immigrants, born in Harlem, raised in the South Bronx. You're black and you're chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He said, it's a wonderful country, Sam. It's a wonderful country. This is a country I love. I will argue. I will debate anyone who wants to debate. What we have to do is not simply scream at everybody. Let's have a conversation. And I would say of General Powell what Harry Truman said of General Marshall. He is a tower of strength and common sense. When you find somebody like that, you have to hang on to him. I found something that I did well and something that I love doing. And when you find those two things together, man, you got it. It is a personal privilege and honor for me. I consider General Powell a friend. General Colin Powell, please accept this Global Freedom of Expression Leadership Award for your lifetime of representing and defending our First Amendment freedoms. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you this evening as you pay tribute to all of these wonderful people who have been involved in the work of your group and who also represent the kind of fantastic things that we have to say uh, about what we are doing with respect to freedom of the speech. But I have a deep sense of feeling for this organization. But more importantly, I have a deep sense of feeling for what you stand for. I have been uh, an American in public life for going on 50 years. The first 25 of them, 35 of them were to be a soldier. And as a soldier, I had responsibilities. And one of the responsibilities I had was to defend the Constitution of the United States, to defend the United States of America. And one of the things that was so precious to me is that in serving the United States of America and defending the United States of America, one of the things I have to defend is not just fighting an enemy, but dealing with another enemy that could come about. And that is somebody trying to shut down the freedom of speech. 
And that's why I believe that the First Amendment, the first element of the Bill of Rights, I think is one of the most important elements of our Constitution, and especially of all of the amendments to the Constitution. How can I say that? What do, what do I mean? What I mean is that I was fighting for freedom of speech. I was serving my country for freedom of religion. I was doing everything I could to protect my country in every single way with respect to what we stand for and not just battles or armies, but things, visions, what we are doing here tonight. I remember so much that in the military, I would occasionally get into these little fights with some members of the media. Uh, and uh, it was something I had to stand for. And what I would say is, look, I like working with the media. I trust the media. I hope the media trust me. But you have to understand this. The media, I will help in every single way to give them all the information I have and they need to go on the air, with one exception. I also have to protect the soldiers of the United States of America. So there's always a little bit of a conflict and how close we can come between these two objectives. My responsibility as a soldier, as a citizen, I think, is to tell the public, tell my fellow citizens all I can as long as I'm not putting their lives at risk because all of the people that I worked with in the army were serving, putting their lives at risk. But I had to defend the rights that they have, the rights to come home safely, the rights to always believe and get ready to fight for freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and all the other freedoms that line up in your wonderful organization and in our wonderful country. And so I wanna thank all of you for coming together tonight and to give awards to these individuals. I am especially honored and pleased that you would see me fit to give an award of this kind. But I wanna tell you, and I can promise you this, I have gone through this many, many times where people have said, tell us more. Nope, I will tell you what I can tell you, but I will not give away any things that you should not have. And so I've tried hard to always, always be honest with the public, to be honest with the press, press is the public, the public is the press. And that's what we're all about. I cannot imagine an America that does not believe in these values. I cannot imagine that I fought for an America that did not realize what freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and all the other freedoms are about. That's the America I fought for. That's the America I believe in. That's the America so many Americans believe in. And we have to stand up against those Americans who see fit not to support us. This is what we do for a living. This is what I'm prepared to give my life for. My rights to speak out, your rights to speak out. This is what the foundation is all about. This is what you guys are all about. This is what makes your organization so impressive and so important to the nation. And I hope that you will appreciate that. And I also want to thank you once again for what you have done to honor those of us who have received the honor. I am honored because I'm not sure I really deserve it compared to those members of the press, members of the media who have also put themselves in danger without being able to defend themselves, but they defended the country. They defended the country they believe in, a country that we could not be the country we are if it wasn't for those of you who cover the press, cover the media, tell us the truth, and fight against those who will not tell us the truth. I've always tried to tell the truth I've always tried to do it. I've gotten in trouble a few times in the military or in even civilian life when I pushed back and said, no, won't do it, can't do it. Why can't you do it? Because I'm violating the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But more importantly, I'm violating the people of the United States who are expecting me to do it the way I have said I will do it, the way I have been told to do it by the Constitution, and the way I have been told to do it by every one of my fellow citizens. And when I see something wrong, I will speak out about it. I've done that a number of times, had to do it with the, with, with the flag several times, honor the flag, honor what it stands for, but don't want to burn it. But if you do want to burn it, you have the freedom to do that. It is a piece of cloth that has been purchased by a civilian, and that piece of cloth is owned by that civilian to do what that civilian wants to do. I hope he won't do it but he has the right to do it and the freedom to do it. And because he has the right and he has that freedom, I have protected my rights and my freedoms.
It's a great pleasure to be with you tonight to share this evening with all those who are being given honors and to give my best, my best wishes to the Freedom Forum. You guys are making the difference. Thank you. Friends, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you next year at the Anthem. If you haven't already made your donation to continue the work showcased in tonight's incredible program, here's your chance to support the next 30 years of the Freedom Forum's mission to foster First Amendment freedoms for all. You can do that by visiting freedomforum.org slash FEA. Please stay safe and healthy so we can gather next year together to celebrate our First Amendment freedoms. Thank you, everyone, and good night.